Welcome you all for this evening celebration on Guru Purnima. Guru Purnima is otherwise known as Vyasa Purnima also. Where we take Vyasa as the most ideal Guru. And we take his birthday as a reference point for us to celebrate the entire Guru Parampara. We are not doing only for Vyasa. We are taking him as a representative. And why we have taken Vyasa is because Vyasa single-handedly had the contribution to all the three authorities on Vedanta. He is the one who compiled the Vedas. Before him, Vedas were all scattered. He compiled it and presented it. In that form, he is the one who gave the Vedas, Upanishads. Then he authored Brahma Sutra. Then he compiled and composed also. He composed this 18 Puranas and one Itihasa, Mahabharata, and Bhagavad Gita, which is also an authoritative text, forms part of that Itihasa. So therefore, we have a direct reference of Vyasa to all the three authoritative texts. Prasthanatraya, we say. Upanishads, which is the end portion of the Vedas, and then we have Brahma Sutra and Bhagavad Gita. So therefore, we take Vyasa as a reference point and we give our respects to the entire Parampara. That is why Vyasa is a guru for all the Sampradayas. Vyasa. All the sam sam Sampradayas divides post Vyasa, we have different names. Pre Vyasa, we have different names. But Vyasa as a central figure is there in all the systems we have. So we take Vyasa as a reference point. On this day, we pursue this. Those who have been pursuing the knowledge, Vedanta, for us, this is the most important day. So on this day, we pay our homage to the entire parampara. And we don't go into this Vyasa Puja and all that ritualistic part of it. As far as we are concerned, we take only this as an opportunity for us to stand. That's what this gathering is all about. Whether it is online or offline. Right. So for those who are offline also and online also, it is the opportunity we take to explore and investigate into some aspect of this Vedanta philosophy. And the topic we have taken for the day is the law of attachment. A first I'll give a brief about the word law and then we'll go into exploring what is attachment and then we can see what is the law of attachment. 
then we can mix and understand it. So we will understand the word first, and then we can go to the sentence. What is this? Law of attachment, sir. What does it say? Now, when we say law here, there is a difference between universal law and man-made laws. One difference is there. Of course, there are many. I'm just going to touch only a few points now. One of the main differences for any man-made law, there is always, you will find an exception. For every rule, there is an exception. When there is a red light, red light in the signal, no vehicle should cross. But there is an exception. Ambulance can go. When it is going to pick up a patient or take the patient to the hospital, at that time it can go. There is an exception. For every law, every rule that we have made, always there is an exception. When we say law in Vedanta, there is no exception. This is the one aspect where man-made law differs from universal law. But then there is another aspect where it resembles. It is very similar. It is the same thing. Both man-made law calls for also universal law calls for your compliance. You have to obey. The moment there is a rule, you have to obey. There is no options there. Like there is no exceptions we saw. Similarly, in man-made law also what is to be done, sir, you have to obey the law. At least in exceptions, there is a possibility in man-made law. In universal law, since there is no exception, it calls for absolute complaints. Right? At no point we can say, sir, give me an, an excuse. That is why first we should understand what is the difference. Right? So this is the basic understanding. Of course, there are other things also we have, but we are not going into that detail. So this much if you know, more than sufficient for us to explore into what is this idea called attachment. So first we will see what is the meaning of attachment. When we say, what is the meaning, sir? Attachment means an emotional bondage. Emotionally, a person feels bound to something or somebody. It doesn't matter whether it is an object or being. So what is this attachment, sir? Attachment means we are just getting bound. How that bondage happens? Bondage caused by your indiscriminate, irresponsible relationship. Your indiscriminate irresponsible preferential relationship with somebody, something. So what is attachment? Attachment is an emotional bondage caused by your indiscriminate thinking, essentially. <laughs> then what is it? What is it doing to you? And what is the effect of that? Okay. We understand, sir. We are getting attached. What is the starting point? What is the starting point of attachment? There are two causes we give. One is a primary one. Second one is a secondary one. Primary and secondary. Like for the tree, we have primary root and secondary roots. Same way, 
we have primary cause and a secondary cause. The primary cause is there is a fundamental division we have in life. I divide things, everything about life into mine and not mine. Few things are mine. Many things are not mine. And all my life what I am doing, struggling to preserve as I am working to preserve as I am working to multiply what I have, I keep looking for how to convert what I am not having to be mine. This is, this is what in life is. Everybody says, oh, very busy, sir, very busy. You are busy about what? Working so hard. You are working so hard for what? So busy. What are you doing all your life? Only two things you do. One, you want to preserve whatever is there and then multiply that. Keep growing. Two, you wanted to acquire what is not mine. I have a double bedroom house. I don't have a four bedroom house. As I am working to preserve this double bedroom house, I am just giving an example. Huh? <laughs> okay. Don't think you know. Sir is giving his case. Example. Because if I pick any one of you people, you will get angry with me. Why are you picking me? So, as a rule, I have fixed. Any example, I give only myself. So that we know, no one can argue. As I wanted to hold on to this, I want to convert the four bedroom to mine. This is the primary cause. And this primary cause itself has a tremendous implications. Now, beyond this primary cause, you are stretching and you are expanding your horizon. No? What you call as mind, that notion is called attachment. See that? So when we say mind, what is referred is attachment. My child, already attachment is there. That is why if you see carefully, the Mother's love towards the child is natural. Isn't it? No one has to teach mother to love the child. It is automatic. Whereas the child's love towards the mother is what? Father, I take it out of equation. Right? Fathers, you are out of equation. Because father's love also towards the child is what? Natural. It's not natural. Natural love, if, if, if at all we claim to be existing, it is there only from the mother to the child. Reverse never happens. That is why every parent has to keep on telling the child, you know how much we sacrifice for you. <laughs> Isn't it? That is why most of us would have realized. At least I got that idea. Till I got a child, I never understood my father. I never, never understood my mother. The moment we have a child only, we start loving our parents more. Why? Why that is the case? Isn't it? This way it is natural. The other way it is to be cultivated. You have to keep telling, see, I belong to you. 
I belong to you. I belong to you. You have to keep on reminding the child. Whereas parents doesn't have to do that. Mother definitely doesn't have to do it. Why? Because nature has given that for the protection of the species. If mother has to be cultivated, it becomes a it becomes a problem for the species survival. Don't think mother has love. That is also attachment. Why not? It is because my child. Imagine suddenly in the hospital they say, Oh my God, we made a mistake. We have changed. Six and nine got changed. Becomes a problem then, no? Suddenly we start feeling this is not my child. So in attachment, what is happening? Sir? In attachment, we go on developing this selfishness. So whenever we use the word attachment, immediately you need to understand what attachment is nothing but manifestation of your selfishness. Then we inquire into, sir, what is selfishness then? And from where selfishness comes? Selfishness is a product of ignorance. What is ignorance? Ignorance means lack of knowledge. Like, what is darkness? Absence of light. Same way, what is ignorance? Absence of knowledge. That's called ignorance. From that absence, what comes is selfishness. That selfishness is what is driving your relationship to the world. That type of relationship is going to be that of attachment. See that? So ignorance produces selfishness. Selfishness produces attachment. So if you have to understand attachment, you need to understand what is selfishness. See that? What is selfishness? Being concerned about oneself. Right? Imagine there are about 25 people sitting. Right? Somebody brings laddu. And they keep 25 number. What is understood? One each. Okay. I jump and take the first laddu. What do you call me? Selfish? I like laddu. You can say, this fellow doesn't have culture. Some refinement. First you should offer. No? At least ask. Is it, you know, want to have nothing. The moment they bring that laddu, I jump and take. This will not qualify me to be called as selfish. When I jump and take the second laddu, there it is to be called as selfish. They're all in me. First laddu is not selfish. Why? Because 25 are there, 25 laddus are here. I jump and take. At the cost of someone else's pleasure of having that laddu, I give that pleasure to myself. That is called selfishness. Correct. In here, why do I do that? What is the reason for me to do like that? Because constantly I have been thinking in a particular manner. There is a thought process. What is the thought process in me? I alone exist. I discount the presence of all of you till 
I get satisfied till I reach a point where I cannot afford to have any more laddus, I will keep eating. After I reach a point where I cannot have laddus anymore, then I start becoming charitable. Distributor. Have no? Yeah, empty plate. Right. Why? My appetite is 25, possible. Imagine. Imagine my appetite went to be 50, then what happens? The person who brought that laddu, I will get angry with that person. You brought only 25. 25 people are there, means you have to bring exactly 25, is it? Huh? Can't you think that there will be two they will eat? All these arguments I will give. Why? Because my appetite itself has not been satiated. So what is going on inside me? Within me, I have been constantly thinking only about my pleasures. My enjoyment. How much? Too much. Too much of thinking about oneself. Exaggeratedly, excessively, you can add words, exclusively, I think only about my welfare. I'm concerned about my thing. The moment I am, I am fully concentrating only about my welfare, I am concerned about my welfare. Obviously, that means I don't care about others' welfare. Okay? This is very important. Unless you fix this point, we can never progress into what is the nature of attachment and what it is going to do to you. And what it is actually doing. Right. Now, since I am not thinking anything except about my things, my, my pleasures, my emotions, my thoughts, my ideas, I think this is the way it should be done. Therefore, that is the way it should be happening. Anybody where to think Anything other than what I believe, what I subscribe to, what I do, pounds on them. Okay. Keep this in one side. This is what is happening internally to me. Okay. Then I keep interacting and transacting with the world. When I am transacting with the world, you do one more mistake, second mistake. Now these are all secondary. Primary one is the fundamental belief. You divide things in two categories. Certain things are mine, not mine. This is the foundation. On that foundation, along with that, we are adding this also. What is getting added now? First thing we have added to that is selfishness. Then what we are going to do is we look at it from another side. From the other side, when you see, we find people having transactions with objects and beings around. A. And imagine the same case where I have that selfishness And I have the keen appetite for laddus. Mark, these are two things. My appetite for laddus is different from fundamental selfishness. Remember that. Okay. When my selfishness is what is projecting the, is what is using the desire, the appetite for laddus. Okay. What is happening? I rush. Imagine one of you from the 
group offer your laddu to me other 25 of 25 rest of the 23 are resisting that i am reaching out for second laddu whereas one of you take a stand what for whatever reason maybe you are having you know diabetes or you don't like laddus or generally you don't like sweets or you may have some agenda to get out of me the reasons can be thousand i can go on adding reasons okay for whatever reason of your own which has got nothing to do with my appetite for laddus offer your portion of laddu to me now what will happen to me i start looking at you different from the 23 correct okay now what is the thought process in me when i am seeing you i start considering you as a different person such a good fellow then you know even though shrinivas has come all the way from atu training seven hours but to he offered to me wow even though he did bring it it's okay you know he offered that laddu to me wow Very sweet fellow, he's such a nice person. I wish everybody like him. I don't know why these people, you know, all first time offer to me, no? Isn't it? Each one is reaching out and they are simply having. And then after eating half lardo, the fellow asks, "He said, 'Did you have the lardo?' <laughs> after you already have yeah, eaten half, bad people. That's a good guy." is good is good is good is good what i am doing i start admiring him as i go on admiring a person what happens some connection gets established okay and then one of you come here and say sir we got a new car i just brought that car let's go for a drive new car what are the cars i sit in the car and you show me all the features in the car you see the seat adjustments are there are eight different adjustments are there in the seat you can adjust this way that way When you're driving, are you going to adjust the seat, or are you going to drive the car? Then you sit, and you see the rooftop. It opens, closes, and then you see this button. You press that button. You show this. You hear the acoustics, and you see the suspension. You see the acceleration. I see all those things, right? And the drive was such a fantastic one. A drive man, superb it is, superb drive. And then every time I go to my car, my thought goes there. That drive was what a pleasant drive, you know. Nothing like it. And then I go on the road, I see a car passing. Superb. I stop and admire the car. And there are people who stop and take selfie with other cars, you know, some brands, Lamborghini. You keep a Lamborghini. Right. I got one fellow sent his car here. For two three months, I was really a big man here in the apartments because he sent that uh, what is that? Ghost. Rolls Royce. Rolls Royce Ghost. He sent. Not for me. That is my conspiracy. <laughs> We are very new to this place at that time. 
So I told him, you come here, we will go and pick up some some Swamiji from the airport. Uh, initially, he thought of coming directly to the airport. I said, no, 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 you come here. So that, you know, because anyway, he was going back, I have to be coming along with Swamiji, so I can't bring my car. So gave some justifications and told that fellow to bring the car. And I told him to come about two and a half hours earlier. Uh, I gave him wrong timing of the flight. He came and he had parked there. And you know, where was he? Full size. Full size. And then deliberately I went there to, to a price, you know, just to check the driver. As though I'm so worried about that fellow. <laughs> just to see that, you know, I, oh, you have come this way. And the fellow's going for a walk, you know. <coughs> and two fellows I saw from here. I asked him to park here so that I can see from this what's going on in this place. And fellows are standing there and taking selfies. It's not your car. Right. Such a pleasure you know, to see. Of course, there is a difference. Yeah. There is a, definitely, there is a difference in the car. You sit inside. Such a pleasant one, pleasant one, pleasant one. More and more and more, you are thinking now of what? How that was pleasant. So, any interaction you have with the world, what you do is you mentally repeat and you do the repetition in two manner. One, you repeat on the good qualities, appreciated qualities and how pleasant that experience was. What is referred to as Sukha Adhyasa or Shobana Adhyasa. There are two types of Adhyasas we do mentally. And this mental repetition is what is referred as musing over the object. What Krishna calls in the Bhagavad Gita as Dhyayana. Vishaya Dhyana, he says. You are doing this Dhyana over the Vishaya. On what? Sukha or Shobana. Sukha is a, how pleasant that experience was. Or you admire certain qualities of the objects or beings. So as you keep doing that, you are adding to your attachment. How? As you keep relating to that object like this, a point would come where minus that object or that being, I start feeling a vacuum. See that? As the boy starts loving a girl, if she is not there in the class, what happens? The whole class looks empty. He gets so disturbed in the class. Why? She's not there. The absence of that person he becomes incapacitated to function normally. He's not able to eat, he's not able to talk to his friends, he's not able to, you know, attend to the lecture in the class. Everything gets disturbed. Why? Because now that he has got attached to that person, it starts showing to him that without that object, your life is zero. There is no meaning to your life. Therefore, what he will do? Go back to the first point. Mine, not mine. Not mine. What you have to do now? Reach it out to bring it to my fold. And this need not be with something which you have transacted, remember. We all think, okay, sir, does it mean that it has to be experienced by me? Not necessarily. It can be even the fictitious one. Remember, just a fictitious idea is sufficient for you to go on thinking over and over again. This is what we call as irresponsible thinking or referred to as indiscriminate thinking. 
to be more philosophical, we call it as indiscriminated thinking. But if you have to tell the person directly, it is actually irresponsible thinking. In that irresponsible thinking, what is happening? Even that fictitious one will start appearing as real, as actual. Osho gives a beautiful example for that. He says, it's like that Bharat Mata statue. He says, <laughs> no. Indeed, uh, the place where you are staying, right opposite to his, from his room, there's a lake. And in the lake, in the center of the lake, they have a statue for Bharat Mata. Right? Have you seen that? Bharat Mata photos, pictures and all you have seen, no? Right? <coughs> Imagine a person starts thinking, there is a person called Bharat Mata actually. It's a lady. She is with chains and all that, you know, you have seen the pictures. And then, you know, suddenly uh, that in the old movie, Salah, they will show. How to show, you know, India got freedom 1947. Next shot will be, ah, the chains are broken and she is standing with the flag. And you see that picture. He says, if imagine a person starts believing for someone to paint, he would have had an idea, wasn't it? The one who had painted had an idea of eyes, eyebrows, hair, forehead, nose, etc. Everything he had a visualization. On his visualization, he has painted that picture. And you see that picture and you start believing there is actually a Bharat Mata. This is what we call as fanaticism. When you get attached, what is it? How your attachment surfaces? One, in ideological, you become fanatic. Behavioral, you start imitating. Ideologically, when you get attached, you will become fanatic with that. Then, when you get attached, how your attachment surfaces in behaviors, in your actions, the way you talk, the way you walk, the way you stand, all this becomes what? Becomes exactly like that. The proof is, someone sent me a PPD of the dogs and the pet parents. We don't call them, you know, dog owners. We should call them pet parents. And it's a dog. Now, dog has to be called as a dog. Only. Now, if I say pet, you will not understand. And they have shown pictures of the dog and the pet parents picture over the years. How the face changes. As a rule, we see only the pet parents face changes to have the resemblance of the dog. Seriously, seriously. <laughs> Talking so serious, people are laughing. Not an exception where the dog face has started appearing like the pet parent. I'm consciously saying that. Never the other way. This way it is happening. Why? Attachment. You get attached, that attachment goes to such an extent where your 
physical features itself changes completely. You can imagine how strong it is, how powerful that has to be. So remember, it need not be with an object of your experience or actually you have experienced or seen something. It can be even just a, a fictitious one is sufficient. And then you will start going on and on and on in that. Now, with all this attachment, what is happening to you and what is happening to the object of attachment and what is happening to the relationship? Now, we have to see three things. We have seen what is love and we have seen what is attachment. What is actually happening, how this is happening and all that. What is it and what is the cause of it? Now we have to see, yes sir, now in, atta in attachment there are three things. One is the relationship, two, you, three, the object. Now, what happens to the relationship and what happens to you as a person what is happening to you individually is more important. And imagine if the attachment were to be mutual, it is double impact. If attachment were to be one-sided, 50%. If both are attached to each other, then it is Pranashati, complete destruction only it is. Now, in this attachment, first thing what you start believing is the attachment starts making you to conceive something which is not real. That's a fundamental problem. Like primary we saw, no, same way, here there is a primary mistake. Primary mistake is you will start believing that object or being belongs to you. You see that? So the moment that object or being starts becoming belonging to you, it will no longer be treated by you as a being. It becomes your possession. The moment becomes your possession, even if it is a being, that being also will be reduced to the status of an object. Why? You belong to me. The moment you belong to me, I am the possessor and you are the possessed. A possessed can never be given a choice. We have to clip that wings. Only then the status of it to be claiming itself to be a live conscious being. And you will not even register this. Why you will not even register that? Go to the root. What is the root? Selfishness is the root. In that selfishness, you are, you are concerned, your whole focus is on what? Mine. And what you are going to do to me. The moment I start be believing you to be something that I can possess, Vedanta asks the fundamental question. Is there anything in the world that you can claim to be yours? Anything. The house. Yours. Why do you say no? In the classroom, you'll say no. That's what one fellow did. He made a mistake of telling me. Nothing is mine, sir. There's no meaning of all these possessions. I said, you don't have it. There's no meaning for all these possessions? Yes, sir. I said, next week, 
I get the no note, promissory note. We'll go to the register and transfer the property in my name because it means a lot to me. After that, he stopped coming to the class. <laughs> this guy is dangerous for that. There's no meaning. There's no meaning. What? There's no meaning. Of course, it means a lot to you because you believe that I can possess. When you are not capable of possessing objects, where is a chance for you to possess a being? What are the chances of you possessing a fellow human being? See that beings can be of three categories. No, as far as we are, as far as our knowledge goes, plants, animals, humans. Less than that is objects. Below that is objects. When we say you can't even possess an object, how can you possess a being? Not possible. That means you cannot possess a fellow human being. When you cannot possess a fellow human being, but you feel that you are the possessor. This is what we call as lack of knowledge, ignorance. When you are not capable, you believe yourself to be capable and you have already achieved it. It puts you in complete delusion. This is called delusion. So what is the consequence of attachment to you, sir? First problem is it produces delusion in you. One. Now we go to what you do to that object. Let's see from that side. Okay. To the object, what you do? You start dominating that object. <clears throat> Why you have to dominate? Because my pleasure, my joy is coming from you. You are the source of my joy. So, I have to squeeze the joy out of you. So, more and more I will start dictating, dominating you. That's what happens in every relationship. It's not a rule, but this is how it happens most of the time. In the early stages of marriage, if you see, it will look like the man dominating the woman. First a few years. Correct? Right? Le? Absolutely. Initially. And the ladies, you know, they know exactly what to do with this fellow. <laughs> you know, first thing they'll say, I'll comb your hair. That is why I'll comb it for you. And this will also thinks what eh, he shows is it. And they make you incapable of combing your hair, packing your bags, for everything you have to be dependent on them. And you know the tragedy of attachment is, you cherish that in the beginning. That's the problem. In the beginning, it will appear as though it is, my God, I've been taken care of so much. So someone is paying so much of attention which I have never received in my life. 23 fellows were not giving laddus. One fellow gives laddu. Obviously, what I will do? You see that? So what I will do? Squeeze as much as possible. What all I can get out of you, I will start taking. When I am squeezing like that, when I start dominating like that, what will happen to the other being? They start feeling suffocated. 
And when you get suffocated, what do you do? Run away. That's all. You go away. Say, get out of me. Either you get out or I go out. You decide. That's all. Now, why that suffocation comes? Because of domination. And not only that, you also become violent. Your violence is not towards them alone. Remember, you become violent towards yourself. What is violence now? Whipping. You start whipping yourself instead of we think, you know, we are violence now. You think violence is directed outside. No, it's not directed outside. It is within you. We start feeling that pre 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 pressure. And the tragedy of life is this. You inflict pain to somebody. There is something. Right? I'm not saying I'm not approving it. Right? The real tragedy is the mind which you believe, which is seeking only pleasure, demands pain. Remember that. This is the deep psychology of mind. We all think mind wants to be in happiness, bliss, joy, contentment, satisfaction. Fulfillment, all that. That is what mind will keep telling you. Seek that, seek that, seek that. But think and look within yourself. Whenever you have experienced pleasure, joy, contentment, mind was present or absent? Right. I'll give one example. Other example, after class. Okay. Deep sleep. Deep sleep. Listen, sir. Everybody seeks to get a good sleep. Everybody seeks it. In deep sleep, mind present or absent? <coughs> absent. So, Life experience proves to us that if happiness is, mind is not. Therefore, if mind has to exist, it should be only in pain it can exist. If happiness comes, mind dies. And the mind doesn't want to die. As a survival mechanism, what the mind does to you is I want pleasure, 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 it will go on shouting, but all its doings lead you to what? Pain. Now, when, when I say violence, don't think you are you become violent with reference to the <coughs> object, object of your attachment, please. You start whipping yourself in that whole pro 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 process. Why you do that? Huh? Your mind demands, your mind feels the pain and it wants to have pain in life. That is why we see people, your happiest moment of life, ask them to talk about. And the painful moment of your life, talk about. In two minutes when they start describing the painful moment, tears will start flowing. Whereas, when you ask that fellow to describe the most joyful moment of his life, he will state it as a matter of fact. Have you seen that? Huh? Oscar Award. First time when I got my Paycheck. First time I won a medal. 
first class that I took, first lecture. Wow. It's a matter of fact. Nothing happens to me as a, as a person. There is, when I'm describing the pain, there is more depth to it. That's why I start crying. Otherwise, why crying? What we don't understand is, your mind wants pain only. Remember that. And attachment is the quickest, easiest way to get what it wants. Because attachment is passed away as love. It can easily dispose that off and say, love man, can you live life without love? Is it wrong to love? In life, there has to be some emotions, no? If there is no emotions at all in life, what is the point? All these arguments it will give, it's very easy to pass. Attachment will be taken as love by every one of us. Very easy that is. Easiest way to get. So as a result, what is happening? You start whipping yourself and also you start feeling the things. And as a consequence, what happens to the relationship? So we have seen what's, what is happening to the other, what is happening to you and what is happening as a, as a basic one. Philosophically, you are wrong. Psychologically, you whip yourself and you create pain to yourself. To the other, what you do? Suffocate them. When all these things are happening, what will happen to the relationship? Relationship will crack. Relationship will suffer. There will be relationship breakage. There will be separation. And the most interesting part about that is, this doesn't happen in one shot. One shot, if it happens, it is easy for us to wake up. Like most of you would have heard this story of the frog experiment. Boiling water and slowly heating that water. It adjusted, 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 and the frog never jumps out and it dies in the heat. That's exactly what is happening to us here. Because the relationship breaks not in the one go. Slowly it goes. So what is the first sign of relationship is breaking? Friction. There will be a friction between you and the other. Rupture. And the rupture goes on and you adjust. How do you adjust? Push it under the carpet. Just a fight here. One day fight. It's okay. I forgive you. You forgive me. Let's go for a movie. Or we'll go for shopping. And the problems all. And then what happens? After two, three days, another friction. Another fight. If you see that, the most attached ones will never talk to each other. You know that? Now they think it is detachment. Detachment, extreme attachment. In extreme attachment, because they start a conversation, instant flare up, fight. So they say, I come, quietly I sit, and that's why men have a way of doing it. They switch on the TV. As soon as they come into the house, switch on the TV. And he'll sit. He doesn't understand anything about cricket. Right? But he'll sit and watch. Top spin, you know, googly, he doesn't know. After the commentator says googly, he says, ah, oh, googly. 
All that he knows is he hits the ball, it flies, or he gets caught. That's all they know. You know, most of them don't understand all that, but still they watch. Why? Action. The fight. And the fight comes, you don't register it. So what happens? You push it under the carpet. You push it under the carpet. You push it under the carpet. That keeps on bottling up. Bottling up, bottling up, bottling up. And one day it will explode. Isn't it? Suppression, compression, explosion. Physics. Right? Same thing happens to you also. If you wake up at the stage of friction itself, good. If not, it leads to the second stage. The second stage is where you start feeling the dependency on that relationship. Right? This is the stage where we find the fights reducing. Arguments reducing. Now, arguments and fights are not reducing because you have understood. No. Your dependency has increased. Since I have started becoming dependent, what is the proof that your dependency has increased? You go out for one week, come back, you feel refreshed. Isn't it? At home. You, know, you go out and come back, you feel better. That, that's why during the pandemic, initially we were all enjoying. After a point they said what? Sir, it is toxic. The presence of the husband in the house has become a toxic one for the wife. So she says, what? Please go out. As soon as it opens, they say, go out. Don't stay here. Why? Toxic. What is the stage in that? Second stage is what? You have become more and more dependent on that relationship. Since your dependency started manifesting, you start re recognizing the dependency factor. The friction factor starts dropping. And we all think, oh, now we are good. We are having a so initial only marriage problem and all of a sudden, now we are very good. Why? I scratch your back, you scratch my back. This is the second stage. And remember, every stage it is becoming more and more invisible. Remember that. The first stage is not the most dangerous stage. The second stage is the far more dangerous stage because the problem gets more invisible. Okay. Then comes the third stage. Final stage, almost like. Where you start feeling that compulsive with reference to that relationship. You become obsessive. You become so obsessive with reference to the relationship. Now, how you, how do you know that? How you have become so obsessive? If a person went to come late from office, what is your first thought? See that? You can never think, maybe he has gone for Vedanta class. Currently, he has gone to a temple. You will never get that thought. You will always get the thought what? Car accident. The fellow lying in a pool of blood. That's what you will imagine, no? In that imagination, what, is, what you have done? Destroy that fellow multiple times. <laughs> Isn't it? That if such a thing were to be happening, understand you are in the third stage. The treatment needs to be very intense. Frictional stage, little easy to wake you up. Dependency stage, if I shout little more, you can wake up. If you are in the obsessive stage, 
ice water to be poured. Sometimes people don't even wake up for that. You will be floating, but you will not wake up. What is it now? That is the state, third stage of this one. So in this whole process, when you are getting attached, the law of attachment says what? The law of attachment is you get attached, you lose. You get detached, you gain. Now, we come to the formula, the law of attachment. Full story is only law and attachment. Only now we are connecting. Connection is very easy. We just have to give the wire and go, that's all. Simple that is. When you get attached, what do you lose? You lose everything. What do you lose? You lose the object of your attachment. You lose the relationship. Far more dangerous than losing the relationship is you lose your sanity. You go insane. And the tragedy is if you have not taken care of at the third stage, the fourth stage of attachment is insane. And the tragedy is, he says, the whole world is in that condition now. Moving from 3.75 to 4. The range is only that. See, all, all insane. What is insanity? What is insanity? How do we know we are saying, you know, all the whole world is insane? Insane means a person who is holding on to imaginary. Isn't it? Fictional things. He is treating that as real. You cannot possess anything in the world. That's the reality. You have got into the fictional idea that I can possess something. Can you call you? Is there a possibility to call you sane? What is the definition of a madman? They live in their imaginary world. Isn't it? They are not in the reality. Now, you are also not grounded to the realities of life. You think just because a, you, you, you produce a child, you think the child belongs to you. Just because you have signed in a paper or tied a rope, Ali, you tie it, or you exchange the ring, do something, and you start believing in the reality of the relationship. The reality of the relationship is not on that. You just got into that state of losing your sanity. Can you believe that? Attach you lose. Now, what do you lose? You lose that object, you lose the relationship, you lose your sanity, far, far beyond all this, you lose your Godhood. So when we say, attach you lose, you lose your Godhood. Detach you gain, what do you gain? You gain your Godhead, you gain your sanity, you gain that relationship, you gain that object. Roll with me. The attach, you lose. Detach, you gain. When you get detached, what happens? Exactly opposite of attachment happening. In detachment, Whatever we have said about attachment, you are doing the opposite. In attachment, you are making the other person suffocated. In detachment, what do you do? What will happen automatically there? The other person starts breathing 
freedom. And every human being is craving for freedom, not just a human being. Everything in the world wants to be free. And in detachment alone, that freedom was made possible. Therefore, what happens to that object? What happens to the relationship? And your understanding is correct. Your resolve is correct. Since you have resolved this correct, what is the resolve? They are not to be possessed by me. And root is what? Mine, not mine. In detachment, there is no such division. It's neither mine nor not mine. As a result, what happens? That's called detachment. Remember, this detachment, that moving away can happen at, in two angles. You can move away from that object or you can raise above that object. Either case, you have moved away, isn't it? The wrong method is what? Running away, escapism. That's what we all think to be detachment. Detachment is not moving at the horizontal. It's vertical movement. Either you go upwards or you go downwards. Downward movement is what here? Not devolving. It is go within. Right. In, in upward movement, you grow above that person. When you grow above, also you have moved away. When you run away from that in the horizontal plane also, you are moving away. But this movement is not going to make any difference. That's not detachment. Detachment is to raise up. So when you raise like that, where your detachment's strength is defined based on your reference point that you have for your relationship. What is the reference point of relationship in attachment? Me. Me. In detachment, neither me nor you. Don't say it is opposite of selfishness. In grammar, unselfish. In philosophy, it is selfless. Remember that. We are not discussing grammar. We are discussing philosophy. In Vedanta, opposite of selfishness is not unselfishness. It is selflessness. Because unselfishness is also nothing but attachment at the intellectual level. Remember that. This is also what, that is why we say, an unselfishness is not opposite of it. Then what is opposite of selfish? Selfless. In that selflessness alone, there is a possibility for detachment. So what is detachment? Detachment has got nothing to do with how you relate to the world, the physical plane. It is how you relate to the world mentally. That is why we say you cannot practice detachment. You can be in a state of detachment. That's about it. You can't practice it. If you start practicing, you are in trouble. If you start practicing, what is it, sir? Imitation. Imitation is what? Another expression of attachment only. So you go in any angle, you are in trouble. So therefore, when you get attached, what do you lose? You lose the object, you lose the relationship, meaning the pleasure of that relationship. Also, you lose your sanity and finally, you lose your self. Detach, you gain. 
Mahavakya of Ramatirtha. Attach, you lose. Detach, you get four words. All words are very easy to understand. What do you gain? First, losing, it will happen this fashion. Gaining will happen the other way around. First thing, when you detach, what do you gain? Yourself. And you gain your sanity. From, say, there is a possibility for you to establish a right relationship. Since you have the right relationship, there is pleasure in the relationship and the object stays with you. So, law of attachment needs to be just obeyed. Don't ask for exception here. Sir, my son, it's an exception, no exception. My neighbor, no exception. My wife, no exceptions. Anywhere you are going to relate to the world better, adhere to the law. Attach, you lose. Detach, you gain. So reinforce this idea and seek the blessings of the great masters to help us in our endeavor. Thank you.